Hello, and welcome to another lovely session of Civil Engineering with Tanya J. Laird. I am the aforementioned Tanya J. Laird. Today's music comes from the album Ultre Amare from the artist Livio Amato. A link is in the uh, description below. This will be the fifth lecture in our wood design series. Uh, while I am tempted to say this will be a short episode, uh, well, let's just say the odds of that happening seem slim. Uh, this is going to be a, a video focusing on certain classes of defects found in, or found in boards and lumber, namely global distortions that often appear in boards. These are collectively referred to as wood warping. Now, in the previous videos, we have already discussed a few types of defects in lumber and boards, etc. But warping in lumber can be distinguished from the previous types of defects we discussed. Uh, for example, in lecture 3, we looked at knots and burls. In lecture 4, we looked at shakes, checks, and splits. These defects are largely local, confined to a relatively small portion of a piece of lumber. In contrast, warping is a global phenomenon. A warped piece of lumber is one exhibiting a substantial distortion of its cross-section or cross-sectional alignment across most of its length. A simple way to envision this is to imagine an ideal board. Uh, consider for a second an ideal board. An ideal bo uh, board, post, etc., well, excluding any rounded corners it might have, would be a perfect rectangular prism. Uh, again, a perfect rectangular prism. All six faces of the piece of lumber would be a perfect rectangle, and all faces would be would meet at perfect 90 degree angles. The previous defects we have discussed would not substantially change the overall shape of this rectangular prism. They would be, you know, uh, little defects uh, here and there within that prism, but the overall shape of the prism would remain the same. However, the defects we are discussing today would cause this ideal prism to be substantially distorted in one manner or another. To describe the various types of wood warping, we first need to define a few common terms used to describe uh, different areas and, and sides of boards. As seen here, there are three terms we need to be aware of. With the exception of square posts, most boards have a rectangular rather than a square cross-section. This, of course, is to uh, maximize moment capacity uh, for applications involving bending, flexure, etc. The end of a piece of lumber is simply referred to as uh, the end or the end grain. The wider side of the board is referred to as the face or face grain of the board. Uh, and then finally, the narrow side of a board is referred to the edge or is referred to as the edge or the edge grain. So uh, do be aware of these terms, just you know, put, put them to heart. Uh, know the end, the face, and the edge. So these three terms are very important when understanding lumber and its properties. As we have discussed, uh, wood is not an isometric material, and its properties will vary with direction. That's kind of the definition of an isometric material. As we will see later in this course, numerous properties and provisions in the NDS make explicit references to edge, face, and end grains uh, of a piece of lumber or a board. So also, these in turn will define the strong and weak axes of the piece of lumber as can be seen here. The strong axis will run parallel to the edge, and the weak axis will run parallel to the face of the board. As you should recall from mechanics, the strong and weak axes refer to bending strength, flexural strength. This is why the axes uh, have circular arrows going around them in this drawing, uh, just to indicate rotation or bending about these axes. Finally, there is also a longitudinal axis of the board, as shown here. However, I was actually a bit reluctant to include this one, as the NDS doesn't uh, explicitly reference the longitudinal axis much, at least compared to the strong and weak axes. However, I included it for the sake of completion. The strong axis is often represented as the XX axis and the weak axis as the YY, which would leave the original longitudinal axis as the ZZ axis. With these terms defined, we can now discuss the various types of wood warping. They can be seen here in this graphic from the Wikipedia article on wood warping. A bow is a bending distortion that occurs along the length of a board, and the bending occurs about the weak axis of the cross section or along the face. A crook is similar to a bow, except the bend is about the strong axis of the board, or about the edge. And it shouldn't, uh, it shouldn't be that surprising that you tend to see more uh, bowed than uh, crooked boards, 
uh, crooked boards simply because of the uh, moments, uh, moments and forces required to bend something about the face versus about the edge. A kink is a sudden change in a board's alignment. While boards and crooks warp a board, they warp it in a continuous manner. A kink is usually caused by some local defect, such as a knot. A cup or cupping is a curling of the face of the board. Cupping is unique in that it is the only one of these warping states that actually changes the shape of a board's cross section at a single location. So if you look at, say, a bowed or a crooked piece of lumber, if you cut it at any point, its cross section is still going to be a perfectly uh, square, or, well, a perfectly uh, right angled parallel rectangle, parallel side rectangle but a cupped board actually has sort of an arch in its cross section. So uh, again, it's cupping is unique. It is that one of, it is the only one of these that will actually uh, change the, or directly change the shape of a board's cross section. All of the others simply represent a misalignment of the cross section as you travel down a board. Finally, um, there's twisting, and twisting is really just as it sounds. Twisting is a rotation or a twist of the board about the longitudinal axis of that board. So you can imagine sort of, if you can imagine grabbing a two by four, holding uh, one end really strong, maybe you could like, uh, for example, you could take a very long two by four, uh, put one end of it in a strong vise, and then twist the other end of it, and you would have a twisted board. Well, it wouldn't stay that way, but a twisted board, and just like all of these, were defining defects or warps that remain in place even after you don't have any kind of external load applied to them. So, where do these defects actually come from? What actually causes boards to warp? Um, it's not going to be the result of some applied force, as we just mentioned. Uh, warping in a piece of lumber is defined as it having sort of a distorted shape even after or when no external load is applied. So, you, you, uh, yes, if you take a piece of lumber and just twist it or bend it, it's going to have a warped shape, but that's not usually what we refer to as a warped board. A warped board is one that has a distorted shape even when it's just sitting on the ground with absolutely no load applied to it whatsoever. So how do boards end up warped? Well, it's key to keep in mind that these are not simply a result of an imperfectly cut board. When a tree is milled into boards in a sawmill, the boards are cut as perfect as possible um, with the tools available, and they generally leave the sawmill as a fairly good approximation of a rectangular prism. Now, you know, a sawmill is not a high precision operation. They're not, you know, sitting there with calipers and measuring things to the micron, but, you know, they do, a, they, especially for construction lumber and things, they do a perfectly fine job. And the things that, le the boards that leave a sawmill are a pretty decent uh, approximation of a rectangular prism. Rather, warping occurs in the period of time after a board has been milled. So you can sort of think of this as Right when it gets milled, it, when, I, when you take a, a log and mill it into two by fours or two by sixes or whatever you're making, when you mill a log into boards, right after it leaves the saw, it is basically a perfect rectangular prism, more or less. Uh, generally, warping occurs in the period of time after the board has been milled. What is a, as we've seen, wood is a complex material that comes from a living organism. And so this means that wood can change shape even with no external load or stress applied. The origin of wood warping comes from two primary sources. The first is from the drying process, especially uneven drying. This is a very similar mechanism to what we discussed in regards to checks and some other, and some other defects uh, in the previous video. All right, let us first consider the case of uneven drying and how that can result in wood warping. So let's say we have a single piece of dimensional lumber, just a single 2x4 or something like that. Well, it can be difficult to see how that would result in differential drying, though I can, of course, uh, see that happening. Where this would be more common is a case where you have, uh, say, many boards joined together, or not joined together, but placed in close proximity on a drying rack or in a kiln or something like that. So imagine for a moment you have a whole series of boards each being supported on a series of racks, in a pile, etc. And this is looking at them um, from the end grain. So again, the, the, we'd be looking at this, uh, we'd be looking at the ends of the boards and um, all of these would be supported on some sort of rack or uh, 
or maybe just in a great big pile, uh, although that's not really very common for, uh, you know, actual wood drawing procedures. Although after they're dry, they may, after they've been, uh, after the, the treating or seasoning process, the formal seasoning process is complete, they may still continue to dry a little bit. So especially after they've gone through a kiln or an air drying shed or something like that, um, when they're at least, they might be set, uh, set in a great big pile, and then these might be in direct contact with each other. Well, anyway, that aside, let's think about something. So consider this for a moment. If you have, um, so let's say I have an arrangement like shown. I have, a, a, and this would continue out, would likely continue out in a much larger grid. You would have, a, you know, maybe something, I don't know, 10 wide or 20 tall or something like that. It really just depends on how your particular drawing arrangement is set up, how your facility is set up, that sort of thing. So, and of, and of course we know that we need to dry wood out before we use it as a uh, building material because wet wood is mostly water, probably two thirds water by weight. And we really want to decrease that before we put it in a building um, where it will be susceptible to mold and fungus and insect attack, that sort of thing. Anyway, so basically what I'm doing is I'm applying warm or very dry air to the outside. If I'm going to be, uh, kiln drying, it's going to be very warm air. If it's going to be air dried, then it's just going to be dry air. Um, so dry or warm air is coming in from the outside. So I'm just going to treat this as heat for now. So heat is coming into this wood and water is going to be working its way out of the wood. Water will be working its way out. Heat will be coming in and water will be working its way out. Now, uh, think about this for a moment. Um, now, we'd like to think that, you know, everything will just sort of heat up evenly and everything will dry out evenly, but we know in reality that's probably not going to happen. Rather, what's going to happen is think about how this stuff is actually going to lose its moisture. What's going to happen is you're going to have a, if I, if, you know, when it's, when at the very beginning of the drying process and at the very end, the whole stack of lumber will have approximately the same moisture content. However, uh, somewhere in the middle, you might have something like this. If I were to plot a uh, moisture content versus distance, a uh, distance from the center, you might end up with something, a plot kind of like this. You'd have a minimum moisture content on the outside and a maximum moisture content on the inside. And that would be along one axis. And if I were to plot this along another axis, this axis here, I could do something similar like this. So again, it makes sense that it's going to take time for the moisture to slowly work its way out of the lumber and for the heat to work its way in. So if you're, uh, if you have a large stack of lumber that you're drying, the wettest board is going to be in the center and the driest on the outside. But this doesn't just happen within an individual board. It also happens, doesn't just happen within a stack of lumber. It also happens within an individual board, which is what we're really concerned about for our topic here. Consider a single board. Think about just a single board here. If I were again to plot the, uh, and let's say the top face is toward the outside of the stack and the inner face is toward the inside of the stack, or sorry, the bottom face is towards the inside of the stack. At some point during the drying process, um, actually, let me, I don't want that there. If I were to plot the uh, moisture content versus distance from the bottom, I would have something like this. Oh, actually, no, that, sorry about that. That is the exact opposite. Okay, minimum moisture content on the outside, like so, and maximum moisture content on the inside at a given moment in time. So, um, and as we have discussed, what will happen is you'll have, um, as wood dries, it will shrink just like anything else. Just you, you can think of, you can think of it in some ways just like a sponge. As a if you ever you know if, I'm sure at some point in your life you've had a sponge and watch it fill with water, and as a sponge uh, absorbs water, it excel, it of course expands as it dries out. It shrinks, and the same thing happens with wood. So um, as basically what's going to happen, as this thing um, shrinks. Uh, as it dries out, it's going to shrink, and this top phase, or this top face, is going to shrink more, 
than the bottom face. So this will want to shrink maybe this much, and this will want to shrink maybe this much. So you get something kind of like this. But of course it can't shrink just the outside edges. It has to shrink the entire cross section, or it's not going to deform just across one, just across the edges here. It's also going to deform across the entire cross section. And so instead of being a shape kind of like a trapezoid, it's going to take on a shape more like this. And that's how, that's one way at least, you can end up with a cupped board. And we could come up with similar mechanisms that could uh, produce, uh, that could pr similar drawing mechanisms that could produce warping, etc. Um, if you think of, um, you'd have a similar phenomenon, uh, say, with warped boards, except you might have uh, different moisture levels on, on the ends of a board, the end grain, then toward the center uh, along its longitudinal axis. But this is one way that you can end up with warp boards just from differential drying um, as during the lumber seasoning process. The second primary mechanism for wood warping is what is known as residual stress. Residual stress is an interesting phenomenon, and you may have seen it in some of your other courses. Uh, and it can be observed in many materials, not just wood. I'll include a link in the description of this video uh, to a video where I discuss residual stress in the context of hot rolled steel sections, uh, particularly in the topic of lateral torsional buckling. It's particularly relevant there. The process is different between wood and steel, of course, but they still can share some similarities. Residual stress in steel is formed by differential rates of cooling. Uh, to work steel, steel needs to be literally red hot. Uh, you need to literally heat it to a red hot temperature in order for uh, steel to be rolled into shapes such as W sections. Then when we it is allowed, then when we're done working it, we allow it to cool off. And uh, when it is allowed to cool off, differential elements or uh, different elements of the section will cool at different rates because of the thickness of material around them, uh, basically their local heat capacity, that sort of thing. And this can result in stresses being locked into the material at different locations, both tension or compression. So um, obviously wood is never heated to a red hot temperature. However, residual stresses can still form. Uh, these residual stresses form as a result of the tree growth process. For example, tree limbs need to be supported. The weight of the limbs needs to be resisted by the stress within the trunk or by stress within the trunk. After the tree is cut down and the limbs are removed, this exterior load disappears. So you might have some interior fibers that, uh, imagine having some interior fibers that uh, initially have stress on them to uh, support the limbs of a tree. Then other fibers growing around them are locked rigidly to those stretched out fibers. Um, and also wood does tend to relax as it ages and as it develops and it grows and develops, etc. But when you remove that limb, it sort of snaps back and you end up with, you can end up with some of that stress being locked in. Um, so after the trees cut down and limbs and the limbs are, are removed, this exterior load disappears, but stress can be still locked into the wood, thus distorting the shape as the stress is relaxed. And the stress and the, relax, the relaxation of the stress is not instantaneous. There can be a, uh, there can be quite a, uh, a, long, a length of time uh, between that it takes for that stress to fully relax. Residual stress can also occur as a result of internal pressure from local defects and other issues with the growth process. A knot, a knot might cause a stress concentration or the ring growth process might, it might introduce some uh, internal stress or pressure if it occurs unevenly. When the trunk is then milled into boards, this residual stress can be released, uh, resulting in uh, warping of some manner of the resulting board. Next, let's discuss how residual stresses can result in warped boards after a uh, board has been milled. So let's consider a tree trunk for a moment. I'm going to draw a very poorly and roughly drawn tree trunk. So we have a roughly drawn tree trunk, series of rings, that sort of thing. Okay, so uh, let's look at a couple different ways. Let's say, first of all, we have a uh, knot. We have some local defect, maybe a split, maybe a knot, that sort of thing. So let's say we have some sort of local defect um, right here. And actually, let's, you know, maybe we'll make it like a knot. And so it would go, might go kind of like this. This is kind of a defect. And the wood grain is going to have to grow and sort of flow around this. So you'll have you'll have fine wood grain all uh, here, 
but you won't have you'll have basically wood grain going this way here and into the and out of the page uh, at the edges and really throughout the entire cross section of the tree trunk so as the vertical load comes down from the branches it's going to have to flow around this uh this uh uh, not here. If I were to look at an individual board, um, when I later mill this, you'd, a knot might end up looking, oh, something like this. And if you think about how stresses flow, if the stress will have to go and flow down, flow down and around, that sort of thing. And you'll end up with a, you might end up, you might have relatively uniform stress far from the knot, but you'll get stress concentration near the knot. And so, uh, basically you get stress concentration and so basically there's more compression right at the edge of the knot than in other locations and so if you then come along and uh now if you cut the board exactly like shown um you may not have too much uh residual stress form because that's well you still have residual stress but it won't, might not produce much warping because the uh because the area of stress concentration is but well between where you're cutting the lumber. But what happens if you come and uh, cut this like right where the knot is, like right through the knot, for example? Well, this area here used to be under a high amount of concentra uh, stress concentration. So you come along and cut this thing, and then and, and that's that concentrate that concentrated stress still exists as you're cutting it. However, the moment you cut it, it will then want to spring back. And it does, and the thing is, it doesn't spring back all at once. Uh, boards will kind of, as a living material, wood will s slowly spring into form over time, releasing stress over a long protracted period. And so what can happen is you may end up then, as the stress is slowly released, you initially mill this thing as a cut board like this, well, I guess with a little knot taken out like that, but then over time it might undergo a warping process um, as that stress is, well, that's not quite that much. That would be a very warped board, but um, something more like this. You know, a nice crooked board like that. And so you can get that kind of warping from a knot. Uh, another case would be, as we mentioned, um, maybe there's a tree limb that's placing a large amount of stress at one location. And then, because uh, you don't end up, wherever you have a tree limb, you're inevitably going to have concentrated stresses. And when then you mill right through that concentrated stress, when, when you remove that, that residual stress then gets released and the resulting board can end up warped. So uh, why does any of this matter? Um, now, uh, oftentimes, especially with things like dimensional lumber, you know, two by fours, the types of things we use in say residential construction, why do I ultimately care if uh, a board is a little warped here or there? I mean, if I'm gonna take, if I'm gonna, you know, throw the board, if I'm gonna build something out of uh, boards and then I'm going to hide the wooden structure behind drywall and siding and plywood and things like that, well, ultimately, why do I care if a board is warped or not? Why does this matter? Um, in other words, is there any actual real reduction in strength that comes with this kind of wood warping? Uh, there may be some aesthetic effects, those are pretty obvious, but does any actual reduction in strength apply? Is, is This is a structural, uh, this is meant to be a, you know, structural course, not an aesthetic one. So if we can't find some structural relevance to this, I probably shouldn't be talking about it. So with defects such as knots, splits, etc., their relevance to strength is immediately obvious. If there is a major gap in the grain structure of the wood, strength will obviously be affected. If there is a literal hole or gap in the wood, it's pretty obvious that the strength is going to be reduced or altered in some manner. But what about wood warping? What about warping of the uh, of the uh, of the alignment of the cross sections as you go down the length of a board or the distortion of a cross section that occurs, say, with cupping. Let's consider how this can be significant. The first example I can think of where this really has a direct impact would be in columns. A bowed or crooked board will result in a warped column. This will result in the column experiencing both moment and axial force when a single uh, axial force is applied. Again, warping inevitably results, or almost in almost all cases, uh, results in a uh, in an eccentricity, and uh, between the load and the centroid of the column, and then that results in moment being induced in the column, even though there is no external moment applied. And Kingston wood will be similar.
Next, let's consider the case of uh, columns, and particularly warped columns, and how they can exhibit uh, decreased uh, axial capacity. So um, consider a column that has, that has been warped in some way. So if I were maybe like a two by four, maybe it is, uh, maybe it's, I'll look at, a, I'll look at the case of say a, a bowed two by four. So we have an ideal case, or maybe when it was first milled, it kind of looked like this from the side. We're looking at it from the edge um, rather than the face. But after it had dried out and seasoned, etc., it ended up warping into something kind of like this. A uh, bowed 2x4. Bowed about, you know, again, bowed meaning bended or, or warped about its uh, face. Now, I'm going to draw this as a line element to consider how this uh, is a problem for columns. So, actually, let me go ahead and adjust this. I want to look at the uh, vertical column first. So if I have a perfectly vertical column, a perfectly straight, perfectly vertical column, and I apply an axial load, and I apply a perfectly concentric axial load, and of course what I mean by a perfectly uh, concentric load is if I have this perfectly rectangular column, I am applying this load directly through its center. So if I were to draw a circle where the load is being applied, it is going directly through the centroid of that uh, column. However, look what happens, oh, we're actually backing up. Um, so what that does is, um, because it's going directly through the centroid, there is no real moment induced. This column is only experiencing axial load, and thus all of its axial capacity, all of its uh, stress capacity, can go toward carrying axial load and axial load alone. Now, however, let's consider the case of a bowed column. Um, actually, yeah, let's go ahead and do this. So I'll draw the initial shape as a dashed line, uh, or the vertical shape as a da uh, the purely vertical shape as a dashed line. But its actual shape, let's say, it's something like this. It's a bowed column. Now, um, when I then go and apply axial load, the axial load, however, is still going to be applied. To the original undeformed axis. I can't really apply an axial load at an angle very easily because axial load almost by definition or not definition in most cases for columns is going to be almost purely vertical so you really can't help but apply most axial loads um, along the undeformed shape of a column because for one I am certainly exaggerating the effect of bowing like this. You don't you wouldn't actually use a a board that is this bowed in, in any kind of construction. This thing would probably be just falling to pieces on you, but we're talking a slight deviation and I'm exaggerating it. So let's now draw what this looks like. Let's draw the cross section, say, oh, maybe um, right here. If Let's say this is cross section A, A here. So I'm going to draw a cross section A, A and explore the relationship between uh, the cross section and the load. And I'll draw it a little more realistically than this super bowed out um, shape here. So we'll have our cross section, our rectangular cross section, say it's a two by four or whatever it is, and a little X to indicate our cross, so we're, we're looking at a cross sectional area. And here, instead of the load being uh, exactly centered, going directly to the centroid of the area, the board's area, it might instead be offset a bit like this. What's happened is, is because the bow is the board is bowed, the uh, actual location of the cross-sectional area has shifted, and that now means that this axial load, instead of being right at the center here, is now uh, deflected, is now um, shifted or eccentric, or it's shifted to the right, left, up, or down, and we of we of course refer to this as an eccentric loading. So um, let's think about what this does to the cross section. Well, we refer to this as an eccentric loading. You may have heard this term before in a mechanics class or in a uh, steel class. It's very common to see. Uh, this is sometimes called the, the variations of this are sometimes called the P delta effect, although it gets a little more complicated than, than just what I'm going to talk about here. So if you have, a, let's call this load P here. And we'll call the offset or the eccentricity E. E is going to be the distance um, from the centroid of the columns cross section at probably at the point of maximum, uh, uh, probably at the maximum eccentricity is what you usually look at. So this would be E here or E here. 
So um, basically that is the, again, the eccentricity E is the distance from the column centroid to the uh, the uh, line uh, of force uh, to the vector of the, the axial load. It's the dis the basically the eccentricity between them. It's the distance between the two axes, and it's the distance between them at the point of maximal bowing of the piece of lumber, or maximum distortion of its shape. So what that does then is think about this. Think back to basic statics. If you have a load offset by a distance, well, you now have a moment arm. And so what you have then is, well, if you have a, if you have a force and you have a distance, that means you have a moment. So you're not just at that location, you're not just applying a axial load, but you are applying a moment. And that moment is going to be equal to P times E. It's equal to P times the eccentricity E, or you could also use the term delta P, which is where the term P delta effect comes from. So what that means then is that your cross section is going to have to resist two types of stresses. It's going to have to resist uh, a stress from your, um, from bending. So your, uh, your bending stress, like maybe you'll have a bend, a stress, oh, flexural, and that might be equal to something like, oh, I don't know, MC over I, but you'll also have your axial stress. And let's go ahead and call this stress sigma actual for now. We'll get to, we haven't actually started looking at the uh, actual, the actual uh, variables used in the code. So I'll just keep it to something very generic for now. Something you'd see in mechanics. And our sigma, sigma actual would just be a, our axial force divided by your area. Now, uh, what this means then is that we ultimately, we cannot carry the same axial load as we could in a um, in a perfectly straight column, because here you only have to carry uh, the sigma axial. In the perfectly straight column case, you only have to carry the pure axial load of P over A. Here you have to ca carry the exact same axial load, but you also have to carry this additional moment. And because both, if you think about basic mechanics both axial load and moment are carried as axial stresses. Again, if you think of a column, if you look at a stress diagram, you'll end up with something kind of like this um, through the cross section. You'll end up with a uniform stress produced by the axial load. And then in the, uh, from flexure, you'll have something more like this. You know, the, again, this is just basic mechanics. And so um, in the area that you have compression, in, in, the, er in the area to above, below, whatever, the neutral axis where you have compression, that compression force from flexure is going to add to the compression force from your axial load. And those two forces combined will have to be less than your allowable axial capacity, where previously all of that axial capacity could go to just a uh, pure axial load. So when you have a warped column, especially a bowed column or a bowed piece of wood um, making a column, you are ultimately directly reducing the amount of axial load that you can apply to that column. A cupped board used as a column will also likely experience some sort of moment. Um, as the axial load is very unlikely to align with the distorted board centroid. Furthermore, the shape of the board's cross section is no longer a rectangle. Um, however, the cross sectional properties for boards are calculated assuming a rectangular cross section. A cupped board will thus have different cross sectional uh, area, different moments of inertia, etc., than what was used in their design. And it's not like you can simply just go out and, um, I mean, I suppose you could, uh, if you had a, a, say, a cupped board that you really wanted to use as a column for some reason, I suppose you could go out and exactly measure its, um, you know, exactly measure its arc and degrees and, you know, get the exact section down and go back, then open up your, you know, mechanics and materials text and uh, use a few integrals to calculate its new uh, moment of inertia about each, each axis. But that is going to be a nightmare, and it's going to be a, a, a bigger nightmare than you realize because you have to, you'd have to take into account that the uh, grain is no longer aligning perfectly with the axes of your warp section, and that would be a fun uh, exercise to uh, assign to students I really wanted to punish for some reason, but it's not something we generally want to do uh, when designing uh, wooden structures. It's generally just not worth the hassle.
So uh, again, if you have a cupped board, the cross-sectional properties are going to be different. And even worse, even if you did somehow plan for that, that calculation would only be applicable to that specific piece of lumber. And as we've also seen already, uh, boards will tend to warp a bit here and there over time. So the minute your board, your warped board warps any more or any less, then your calculation is invalid and suddenly you have to start all over again. A twisted element will also have some inaccuracies in its predicted column capacity. Uh, calculations of column buckling load typically assume a uniform cross-section along the length of the member. As the cross-section effectively rotates as you move down the column's longitudinal axis, the buckling capacity will thus be altered. Uh, some of these warping modes will also alter the ability of boards to properly connect and engage with others. For example, consider a bowed board with another board bearing against it. The bowing can cause a stress concentration that would not otherwise exist. Finally, let's consider how a warped member can result in some sort of stress concentration. Um, this one's fairly straightforward so um, and relatively simple. So let's say you have a um, one board bearing against another, and the simplest way I could show this would maybe be like a column bearing down on a beam. So let's say you have a column bearing down on a beam. In, and first I'll draw the perfectly uh, straight, perfectly uh, aligned, perfectly rectangular type case. So let's say you have a column bearing down on a beam. And despite my poor drawing skills, let's say all of this is a perfect rectangle, or everything here is a perfectly straight line, perfect rectangle, etc. So, um, if we look here, if we, if we were to do, if we were to draw this interface here, what would we see? Well, we would see a rectangle where the, um, and this is the rectangle of the column, and that would be bearing down on another rectangle, um, representing the beam. But if we zoomed in really close, we would see basically two surfaces here. And if they're perfectly flat, they're going to be fully engaged with each other. There's not going to be any gaps. There's not going to be any kind of uh, unevenness, that sort of thing. However, let's consider the case of a uh, bowed or warped column. And I'll, of course, exaggerate, but in all cases where you have curvature, this kind of effect would apply. So let's say you have a column you know what, I will actually make that a little bit more, even more exaggerated, just to make it clear. So we'll have a, an extremely warped column. Uh, I still don't like that, actually. Maybe something... Okay, I'll show it something like this, to really get the point across. Mm, poor art skills again. There, a perfect arch. Okay, so if I then try to apply a column, I'll show this at an angle because I, well, actually, um, I actually kind of like it better the first way. Lovely art skills, I know. And then we have our column coming down here. So if I then zoom in on that surface, what will I see? So if I zoom in on that surface, I have my uh, column coming down like this, and then the other surface from the from the uh, beam holding the column up, the top surface of it might look something, well, probably not that warped, but something more like this. Notice what we have here. Because this bottom surface, the, because the surface of the beam, or of the top of the beam, because the surface is not perfectly flat, it's not going to be able to fully engage. Here we had full engagement between the bottom sur between the end grain of the column and the top surface of the beam. So what that meant is you had a uniform stress all the way through. Here, though, however, only the portions, um, only the portions of the column that are actually directly engaged with that surface are going to be able to transfer load. So instead of the entire instead of that entire column being able to transfer load only a small portion of it is. Maybe something like that. And so what that means is this effectively reduces your allowable stress because you have, um, uh, it effectively reduces your allowable stress if you're considering the entire cross-section uh, when calculating allowable stress, or it reduces your effective cross-sectional area, depending on what kind of interpretation you want to take.
So I think I think the easiest way to visualize this might just be considered this as you've effectively reduced the size of your column. And so previously you could use the entire cross section when calculating strength, when here you're only going to be able to get a much smaller amount of your cross section. And this thus directly reduces what kind of load that column can carry. Now, if you apply enough um, axial load, you might be able to, you know, sort of force the column to engage with the beam just by distorting and things, but that may be difficult. And the same kind of thing could also occur if the column itself is warped. If the end of the column is warped in some way, that may result in a similar kind of mismatch and a lack of proper engagement, and thus that can reduce the amount of load that can be carried. Anyway, I think that's all I want to discuss here when it comes to wood warping. As with any of these topics, we could of course go into much greater depth, but I do have to stop somewhere. With this, we now have finished discussing all of the major local and global defects that I want to cover. We've looked at local defects that interrupt the grain of wood, such as knots and burls. We've considered cracks in lumber that form as a result of bacterial infection or drying, ink shakes, checks, and splits. Now in this video, we've explored global warping effects. We've learned that wood, or through these videos, we've learned that wood is an incredibly complex material and is subject to numerous potential local and global defects. In the next video, we are going to learn how on earth we can actually design anything with such a incredibly variable material. The next video will focus on how the NDS accounts for this type of uh, high variability in wood as a material. So, I hope you found this video interesting and perhaps a bit illuminating. Uh, it is hard to believe we're finishing up the fifth video in this series and we're still just looking at wood defects, but in making this series, I really want to produce a thorough, uh, a very thorough introduction to the topic of wood design. I would say in many, t in many topics, we may actually go beyond what you would typically learn in a university wood design class. I believe this series will likely end up being over 100 videos by the time I wrap it all up, and finishing it is really going to take a, a good long while, but that's okay. I'm really enjoying making these, and I hope you are enjoying uh, watching and reviewing and studying these. So if you like this video, please uh, click the like button to make the robots happy. If you want to share any thoughts or ask questions, please leave them in the comments below. If you would like to keep up with our wood design series regularly as it comes out, click the subscribe button and you'll be notified whenever the next video in the series comes out. If you enjoyed this and would like to support this channel and help make videos like this possible, a link to our Patreon page is included below. I am trying to make this channel viable long term, and as you're probably aware, well, let's just say YouTube monetization is a, a paltry source of income at best. Uh, most creators rely on things like Patreon, sponsorships, merchandise, etc. to make their channels viable. Uh, we currently have one uh, Patreon patron, but uh, we do hope to expand that in the future, so shout out to uh, Logan Patrick for being our first uh, channel's patron. Thank you for the support you provide the channel. Uh, subscribing on Patreon does provide certain perks that I try to provide. Uh, these include the ability to inv influence future videos on the channel and give access to certain uh, resources such as presentation slides and other things. Once we start working through quantitative example problems, the full S-Math sheets or hand calculation scans used in these examples will also be accessible to channel patrons on the Patreon page. Anyway, with that out of the way, I think I'll sign off for the day. I hope you have all enjoyed this lecture or found it interesting at least. I hope to see you all soon in the next video. I look forward to hearing your thoughts and ideas. And as always, thank you.